Yes, Come hungry? If you're not, I've got some weight for you. <laughs> hungry for the word. Amen. Yeah. Because uh, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yeah, amen. His words are spirit, and they are life and health to all of your flesh. Right? So, in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 5, he said, I have fed you with milk and not strong meat because you weren't able to bear it. So I'm going to pray that um, you are able to receive what the Lord has for you to receive Amen. from me today. Amen. 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 All right, well, the first thing I want to just uh, start off with is that um, when we take communion, on that night that Jesus revealed to his disciples what, what the Seder meant, because they had taken that Seder year after year after year after year, but on that night, Jesus said, this matzah, the bread and the cup, which they took every year on Passover, was actually a symbol of what he was going to do in creating a new covenant. Yeah. He said, take the bread and eat it, because this is my body. Yeah. And he said, take the cup and drink it, this is my blood. So when God makes a covenant, he does it with blood. This, this Bible is a record of covenants. Yeah. And, but they were all made in blood, blood sworn oaths. Now, the one that we know about, everyone, if you've read your Bible, you'll know about the covenant that God made with Abraham. Mm. And when God made that covenant with Abraham, he found Abraham and he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. And he said, come out of that country, come out of your family and come to me because I'm going to bring you into a land that I'm going to show you. So Abraham obeyed, except he took his nephew, Lot, <laughs> and caused him some problems. But over a period of years, God is telling Abraham... I'm going to do all these things for you. I'm going to make your seed like the sand of the sea and like the stars of heaven. But Abraham makes this statement. He says, how am I going to have any kids? <laughs> I'm 90 years old. My wife's barren and she's never had a child. But God does something miraculous with her. And he says, your wife shall bear you a son. But they get impatient <laughs> and we end up with Ishmael. But it says over in Romans, in Romans chapter 4, sorry, I'm, this isn't my message, but I don't know why God's leading me here. But uh, in Romans chapter 4, talking about Abraham, the father of faith, God told him, I will make you a father of many nations. Mm -hmm. Not just the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. A father of many nations. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Romans chapter 4, it says in verse uh, 18, it says, who against hope, this is talking about Abraham, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, 
but were strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. But if you go back and read in Genesis, Abraham kept questioning God and saying, How? How are you going to do this? And God says to him, Well, I'm going to have to do something that's going to mark your mind so, so distinctly that you won't disbelieve what I'm saying. Because Abraham's saying, Well, I haven't got any kids and the only person I've got is this Eliezer of Damascus. And God says, no, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. But if you read it, how, how, how did we end up with the name Isaac? <laughs> because they laughed at God's promise. And God said, right, now you have to call your son Isaac which means laughter because you laughed at what God had said. So every time they said Isaac, they remembered, well, we laughed. We laughed at what God had said. But um, Abraham kept saying, how am I going to become the father of many nations? But over here in Romans chapter 4, it says he was fully persuaded. How did he become fully persuaded. God said, right, okay, what you're going to have to do, Abraham, is get me some animals and I'm going to make a covenant with you that you will understand. Because in Abraham's day, uh, people made covenants. But um, The covenants that they made then were covenants based on two different parties, usually two different families, who would come together and they would have discussions about whether we should join. But it would be based on whether you've got something that will benefit me or if I've got something that will benefit you. And if we found that there would be a benefit by us joining together, we would probably then look to make marriages between our families. But someone would have to be chosen as the representative from each family, and then they would swear the terms of the covenant uh, to each other. And then there would be a covenant sacrifice. So what we see in Genesis is God has come to Abraham and he says, this is my covenant that you will keep. The problem's not with God. God will keep his covenant. But he said to Abraham, this is my covenant that you will keep. And he said, well, here in Genesis chapter 15, uh, it says um, in verse 6 it said Abraham believed in the Lord it doesn't say that he believed the Lord it says he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness and he said to him I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Mm. See, he's still not fully persuaded yet. Mm. So God says to him, take a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So he took all these and he divided them in the midst. In other words, he cut them in half and he laid each piece out one against the other, but the birds he divided not. And the, when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. They shall afflict them four hundred years. 
and also that nation whom they serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And you shall go to your fathers in peace, and shall be buried in a good old age. And, so, and then come down to verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp or torch that passed between those slain pieces of the animal. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. God made a covenant in the blood of animals. There's the Mosaic covenant, where God had brought the people out of Egypt and brought Moses up to Mount Sinai, and he gave Moses the new covenant on two tables of stone. Moses went back down to the people with what God had given him, the terms of the covenant. Now, under that Mosaic covenant, God provided healing for his people. So my message today, <laughs> I was wondering how I could get to it, but <laughs> my message today is the contrast between healing under the old covenant and healing under the new. So under the old covenant, as I said, God provided healing, but it, it was quite different to what we understand today. And unfortunately, some people still try to go back to the old covenant and the way God healed there mm. and then try and drag it over into the new covenant mm. and use those practices here mm. and they don't work mm. they can't work mm. we have a new better covenant established upon better promises and this covenant is sworn in the blood of Jesus oh. Yeah, not the blood of bulls and goats and pigeons and turtle doves, but the blood of Jesus, the new covenant. But in this one, we still have to believe what God has said. Just like Abraham had to. But Abraham had the benefit of a covenant that he could see, a covenant he could smell. He could smell the entrails of the bulls and the she-goats and the, the animals that were there, and he could smell the blood. We can't have that now, but God the Father can. God the Father can see the blood. He can smell the blood. He can see the scars in Jesus' hands and on his back and on his head on his feet and God says and when you come to God and you say Lord by your stripes I am healed you're declaring a term of the covenant it's a covenant promise but just to have a, a quick look at um, healing under the old covenant uh, if you have your Bible turn to Numbers Chapter 21. As I say, God provided healing, but it wasn't like the healing that we know of now. But in Numbers chapter 21, <coughs> so it's the first book after Exodus. Amen. Numbers chapter 21, uh, in verse 4. This is uh, children of Israel. And it said, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spoke against God. Can you imagine that? 
people speaking against God. I mean, these are God's covenant people. And they're speaking against God and against Moses and against Aaron. And they said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathes this light bread. That was the manna that God sent to them. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. <laughs> yeah, you reckon? <laughs> For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Moses was an intercessor. He stood before God and turn God's wrath away from his people on a number of occasions. Yeah. And the Lord said to Moses, Make you a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. Verse 9. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. What I would say to you is, if you get snake bit, <laughs> look to the cross. This is a symbol, a prelude of Jesus on the cross. Yeah. Why God told him to make a serpent, We'll know in eternity. But Jesus became sin. He took sin. He took sickness. He took disease. He took infirmity into his body. And in Isaiah, it says in the 53rd chapter that his body became twisted and contorted and it didn't even look like a man anymore. Because he took yeah. all the sin and all the sickness of the world into him. Mm. Yeah. But God said to them, if you look, if you look at the serpent on the pole after you got bit, you shall live. So the analogy for us is if you get sick, you get bitten by the devil, look to the cross. Look to where your redemption was paid. Look to where your healing came from. Amen. Yeah, look to the cross. So, I mean, you had to make sure you could see the serpent on the pole and make sure that you weren't going to get bitten by another snake. But this is one way that God healed. Another way is in Leviticus... So if you keep flipping over, go past numbers, actually go backwards. I told you it was straight after Exodus, I told a lie. Leviticus was before it. Leviticus numbers, so go back to the left. Chapter 14, Leviticus 14. So Leviticus 14, quite a lengthy chapter, uh, but it's talking about uh, the cleansing rites for being delivered from leprosy. Yeah. So we'll just we'll try and read through this and just see how we go. But um, in chapter 14, the Lord spoke to Moses saying. This shall be the law of the leper. So this is Numbers for uh, Leviticus, Leviticus fourteen. This sh verse one. Start in verse one. This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, 
And the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper, then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed, two birds alive and clean, cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. He that is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and shall wash himself in water that he may be clean. And after that he shall come into the camp and shall tarry abroad out of his tent seven days. And it shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave all his hair again off his head his beard, his eyebrows, even all his hair he shall shave off. And he shall wash his clothes. Also he shall wash his flesh in water and he shall be clean. It's not over yet. And then on the eighth day he shall take two he lambs without blemish and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish and three tenths deal of fine flour for a meat offering, mingled oil, and one lot. Do you see how this just goes wow. on and on and on and on and on? And normally the lepers were dirt poor. They couldn't do anything. No, but it, it even gave a, an out for them. You know, if you're poor and you don't have two lambs and a ewe lamb, then you get two turtle doves, if you can catch them. If you can catch them. But... Then over the page in verse 16 it says the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and shall sprinkle of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. <laughs> and the rest of the oil that is in his hand shall the priest put upon the right ear of him that is to be cleansed and upon his right thumb, his ear, his great toe. <laughs> Prior to this, he had to put blood, then he put the oil. The blood and the oil. Uh -huh. The blood and the oil. But this is quite a long process. It's quite complicated. Right? But if we compare that with Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, so... We're over in the start of the New Covenant. Hasn't been established yet, but in Luke chapter 5, so if you were a leper, even in the days of Jesus, these mosaic cleansing rites still stood. But most of the lepers in those days were living outside the city of Jerusalem. But one of them, and in another gospel, ten of them, but this guy, he's decided that he needs to get some healing. Now, I don't know if he's poor or not, or that poor that he couldn't even get two turtle does, but probably because of his condition, he wasn't able to go out and catch any birds. Because it says in verse 12, Luke chapter 5, verse 12, it says, And it came to pass that when he, Jesus, was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, under the Mosaic law, it was the high priest that had to look. And if he was clean, then he could touch him. But this man is full of leprosy probably covered up with rags, might have lost a couple of fingers and some toes and maybe a nose or an ear. 
He's full of leprosy. And he said to Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand, his hand, and he touched him. And said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. What a stark contrast between the cleansing rites under the Mosaic law and full of leprosy and bang, the leprosy is healed. But notice what Jesus did. He touched him with his hand and said, I will be thou clean. Yeah? What about... Um, We'll keep in the New Testament. Just go over to John's Gospel. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. This is the healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. John chapter 5. So John chapter 5 verse... One and it says that after this, thank you, Mary, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches, and in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. You know, if you were there in that, those five porches, you'd be thinking, am I going to be the lucky one today? Am I going to be the one that's going to get in there? I mean, it's it was a bit of a lottery. You know, would, am I able to get into the pool before anybody else? Now, this man who had had this infirmity for 38 years, we don't know how long he's been laid at the pool of Bethesda, but he's, he's waiting for the troubling of the water, and maybe, just maybe, I can get into the pool before anybody else and get my healing. But he encounters Jesus. And Jesus just asks him the question, and he says, will you be made whole? Then he gives you the excuse. How, oh, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. When I'm coming down, somebody steps in front of me. And Jesus just said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And it was on the Sabbath day. So we're starting to see earmarks of healing under the new covenant. Not these long processes, not maybe somebody gets it, somebody doesn't, you know. Jesus starts to preach this radical message of the kingdom of God. And multitudes flock to him because they've not heard anything like this before. They've not seen anything like this before. And in uh, Matthew 15, I'm going to sort of take you all over the Bible today, but Matthew chapter 15, I mean, the message of Jesus and the kingdom of God has been the greatest thing that has ever hit planet Earth. Mm -hmm. To come and to preach that God has decided to make a covenant not just with the nation of Israel, but with the whole world. And in that covenant, every need is met. Our healing is met. Our financial prosperity is met. Our deliverance is met. Remember, when a covenant is made, 
if I'm in covenant with you, I'm in covenant with Pastor Regin or Pat or Cam, and I have a need, if I call on you, I expect you to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on the same part, you would just run to my help, run to my aid. Because mm -hmm. we're in covenant, because you know if you have a need, I'll come and help you. Mm -hmm. yeah. God said, call on me. <laughs> and Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Jesus is our covenant representative with the Father. So all the promises of God are in him. Yes and amen. Yeah. So in Matthew chapter 15, uh, in verse, let's see, 29. Matthew 15, 29. Matthew 15, 29. And Jesus departed from there and came near to the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came to him, having with them those who were lame, blind, mm, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and they cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. One thing I'll just say here is sickness and infirmity and disease does not bring glory to God. There are people who think that this is their cross to bear. I'm bearing this for the Lord. Well, I'm sorry, but you're in the wrong camp because he already bore it for you. You can't do what Jesus has already done. Yeah. Sickness does not glorify God. The healing glorifies God. Amen. Yeah? When people get healed, people don't go, oh, oh well, okay. No, they go, yeah, woohoo! Yeah, praise God, you're healed, you're healed, you're delivered. Amen. But it doesn't happen as often as we would like to see. So what's the problem? What is the problem? Well, it's not God. It's not God is the problem. It's probably tradition. Fear of man. Uh, wrong teaching about the word of God or about the Holy Spirit or about the new covenant and people just either don't bother with it some churches flat out deny having it in their church that mm. healing is not for us today mm. no. it was back in Jesus time. Jesus time and for the disciples and the apostles but today mm. no you better go to the doctor <laughs> You better go to the doctor. You better go and get your script filled. That's the snake on the pole. That's the snake on the pole. Remember the snake on the pole. Remember Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross. I mean, what, what is Christianity if it's just to get saved and maybe go to heaven and live a defeated, sick, broke life here? If that's the case, then maybe... Just go and be Buddhists or Muslims or something else because that's what they believe too. Just go through life and maybe you get reincarnated as a cow, uh, or maybe uh, you know, if you um, I don't want to go into it, but yeah. maybe if you do enough of that, 
you might get to heaven and have 50 virgins. No way. Oh. You know, no way. Who says they're going to be good looking? <laughs> <laughs> but let's just have a look at what the new covenant says mm. about <clears throat> healing for us I think most of us know it I'd be surprised if we don't but we don't put it into practice in uh, go back over to Mark 5 this is where we were last week. We were talking about Jairus and his little daughter. And uh, Mark chapter 5. Does anyone remember what Jairus said to Jesus? It says in Mark chapter. Sorry? What Jairus said. What Jairus said to Jesus. My little daughter is lying at home, dying. But what did he say to Jesus? Come and, and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Jairus recognised there was something about the hands of the Lord. And he said, because this isn't something that the high priests and the Jewish rabbis do. But he said, if you come and you lay your hands on her, lay your hands on her, she will be healed and she will live. And of course, Jesus went in there and took the little girl up by the hand and she revived and came back to life. Christ. But he said, lay your hands on her. And uh, over one page in Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, verse 2, it says, when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence has this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? By his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Josie and Judah and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. He laid his hands upon a few sick folk. The rabbis and the religious people said, Mighty works are done by his hands. Yeah. By his hands. In, uh, let's stay in Mark, chapter 8. Mark, chapter 8. No. Laid his hands on them. Something about the hands. And in Mark, chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, verse 22. So Mark 8, 22. says, He came to Bethsaida. In, um, I think in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said, Woe unto you, Chorazin and Bethsaida, this city. Because he said, If the mighty works were done in Tyre and Sidon, so modern day Lebanon, which were done in you, they would have repented a long time ago and been sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So remember the city, Bethsaida. And it says, And they bring a blind man to him 
and besought him to touch him. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, this is a great way to heal, isn't it? He spit on his eyes and he put his hands on him. And he said, do you see anything? And the man said, I see men like trees walking. So it says he put his hands on his eyes again. And then he said, look up. And he was restored and then he saw every man clearly. But Jesus put his hands on him. So the Lord administered healing a lot of the times by laying his hands on people. And he gave his disciples the same power and authority and sent them out and said, go out, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, freely you have received, now freely give. But it says that they went out and they anointed with oil a lot of people and healed diseases and cast out devils. So you can't anoint somebody with oil except you do it with your hands. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got to take the oil, put it on them and rub it into them. <laughs> so when you anoint, <laughs> the word anoint, I don't know if you've thought about this, but to anoint doesn't mean just drip, drip, drip. To anoint, I mean, is you take oil, or you might pour it on someone, and then you rub it into them. It's like if you've ever had a massage. <laughs> yeah, the person doing the massage will anoint you. They pour, they pour some oil on you and rub it into you. Well, the oil becomes a part of you. So when the disciples anointed many with oil, it wasn't so much the oil that healed. Because Jesus had given them power and authority to cast out devils and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. <laughs> so he has left us a pattern that we really should take heed to and follow. Because yeah. mm. healing is something, and I've said this before, but bears repeating. Healing is something that at some point all of us are going to need. Mm -hmm. Sinner or saint. Yeah. It, it happens because the earth and man is in a fallen state. And the curse has come on the earth. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, out there in the world is devils, the curse, and crazy people. <laughs> it's, it's a wonder sometimes that we can actually get through one day yes. alive Amen. without the grace of God. <laughs> All right. But we know when sickness comes, why it comes. But we also should know that uh, we are redeemed from every sickness and every disease. I mean, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 63, I mean, if you go through the blessing and the curse in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it talks about if you don't serve the Lord, if, you don't, if you're not thankful to him, then all these curses will come on you and overtake you. And so Moses sums it up and he says, also, every sickness and every disease not even written in the book of the law, the Lord will bring upon you until you be destroyed. Now, you can preach on that. These are God's covenant people. But if they don't do what he says and they don't walk in his statutes and they don't keep his covenant, mm -hmm. 
mm. then he will just remove his protection and the curse will just come on them. Mm. In Numbers 21, when we read that the people murmured against Moses and spoke against him and spoke against God, and then snakes came and bit them, they had a light bulb moment. They said, oh, we have sinned. If you ever get into a position or find yourself in a situation where things are going wrong in your life and you seem to be going from one sickness to another, go back and check when they started and see whether or not you had said something against a, a pastor, a minister, an evangelist. Because when you speak against people like that, you're not just speaking against them, you're speaking against who they represent. They represent God. So it could be that you've gotten out from under the covering of the blood. So possibly get just get back under the blood, confess that, get rid of it, give the devil no place. Amen. Yeah, and you'll just see miraculous things happen. I mean, if you stay outside of the blood, you're staying outside of your covenant protection. But um, Galatians 3.13, can anyone quote Galatians 3.13? Christ has redeemed us from the curse. Curse of the law being made a curse for us. So, okay, so that's, we know, okay, we are redeemed from the curse of the law, the curse that was written in Moses' law. But what are we to do? What are we to do to get that healing? To get that uh, redemption from the sickness or the disease? Well, in Mark 16, so we're still in Mark, let's go to the end of Mark. As I say, this is things, this is not some great revelation, this is something that every Christian should know. Um, in Hebrews, so just hold the place there in Mark 16. But in Hebrews chapter 6, I'll just uh, offer the page there. You can stay in Mark. So you can write down Hebrews chapter 6 if you want. Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, 1. Hebrews 6 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. The writer of Hebrews, and I believe it's Paul, He's saying the foundation of our faith, the foundational beliefs that we should have, one of them is laying on of hands. Yeah? A lot of people, when you know altar calls are put out and they say come forward for prayer, a lot of people don't want to because they don't want someone putting hands on them. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, 18, or 17, he says, These signs shall follow them that believe. I think we all believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. I think everyone in church this morning was speaking with new tongues. <laughs> they shall take up serpents. 
those fiery serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So Jesus said, and in James 5, 14 and 15, uh, he asked the question, he said, is there any sick among you? If there is, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord, and the Lord will raise them up. And if they've committed sins, it shall be forgiven them. So call the elders of the church with oil and let them anoint that person with oil and pray over them with anointing them with their hands and pray the prayer of faith and the Lord shall raise them up. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus said, lay hands on the sick. Lay hands. Wave hands? No. What about blow on people for him? Receive your healing. No, no, that's all about, about all you'll get. What about if we get everyone to laugh? Will that bring the healing? There's laughing ministries in the world. Yeah, get everyone to laugh, roll on the floor and laugh. And you'll get your healing. No, Jesus said, lay hands on the sick. Lay hands on the sick and they'll stay sick. No, they shall recover. They shall recover. Yeah. I mean, some people will say, well, why hands? You know, I can read in the Bible and there were times when Jesus healed people without touching them. Yeah. But they might have touched him and he said to them, or they just came to him and he said, your faith makes you whole. However, the main doctrine for the body of Christ is to lay hands on the sick. Okay. I mean, it's been 2,000 years, church, and we still quite haven't got this right. There are churches that won't do that. They just pray a general blessing over the congregation and just receive a healing. Now, sometimes that people will get healed, but it's not the prayer so much. It's more the people's mm. faith that's receiving the healing. Mm. But lay hands. It's like, you know, Hebrew says the principles of the doctrine of Christ. One of them is the laying on of hands. There are others in there. I mean, each of them is a message on its own. You know, the doctrine of baptisms. Mm. That's split up more churches than anything, I think. But we'll finish here today. But remember that if a family member gets sick, your spouse gets sick, take oil. Anoint them with oil, pray the prayer of faith over them, and the prayer that is prayed in faith will, it says, save the sick. It will heal the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. Yeah. So let's get back to some of the foundational doctrines that the Lord gave to the church. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. They will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Because it's not us doing the healing. Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus. doing the healing yeah. through us, Amen. through our hands. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We Amen. have heard your word today, Lord, and we will follow your direction. We will lay hands on the sick, Lord, expecting you to raise them up, you to heal them, because you are the healer, Lord. And this is a sign for the church. It is a sign of the body of Christ that we are the ones, Lord, who minister your healing 
not just to your people, but also to the world. Thank you, Lord, that you will anoint each one of us. You will bless our hands. You will give us power and authority that we go out, Lord, into the world. And people hear, Lord, that we are healed. We receive our healing. We give you praise and glory, Lord Jesus. You are the healer. You work with your holy word and confirm it with signs following, Lord. So we just give all glory to you now, Lord Jesus. That we are the redeemed, we are the healed. If sickness comes, we look to you, we look to the cross, Lord, where you bore our sicknesses, you carried our pain and our diseases for us. And by your stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. Praise and worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.